Well, welcome. We're going to get started here. Uh, once again, this is Brian Rowe with LS NTAP. Um, this training is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel. Uh, thank you so much, Miguel Willis, for organizing this and for organizing the Team Child Hackathon. I'm turning it over to you at this point. I look forward to hearing about how to create hackathons and the great projects that came out of this one. Uh, yeah, thank you, Brian, uh, and thank you, uh, LS Centap, for hosting this presentation, and uh, really thank you to uh, Pro Bono Net uh, as well. Um, today we'll be talking about uh, uh, and sharing the teams, uh, some of the things that went on at the hackathon, and just the hackathon model. Um, again, my name is Miguel Willis. I'm a third-year law student at Seattle U uh, Law School. Uh, so to start off with the, the Team Child Hackathon, I, I'll just start off and talk a little bit about Team Child. Team Child's a uh, nationally recognized nonprofit in, in Washington State serving uh, children in crisis, and they've been doing this work for over 20 years. Um, and you know, their job is to kind of break the uh, cycle of arrest and detention that drives the school to prison pipeline. And they do this by, uh, uh, you know, going in and bringing lawyers and helping uh, kids who have got in trouble or entered the juvenile uh, uh, system uh, through, you know, an advocacy on education and uh, and mental health. Um, they wanted to, uh, from their exposure to uh, a hackathon, uh, they wanted to organize one that was specifically around youth uh, justice. Um, so that was the kind of ambitious goal uh, of, of that hackathon. And I'll talk more specifically about the Team, Ch uh, team Child Hackathon. But first, I guess I'll just back up and, uh, and talk a little bit about hackathon. So when people hear uh, the word hack or hackathons, they usually think of these guys right here. Um, and you know, just to kind of dispel the myth, um, when we're talking about uh, a hackathon, we're not talking about these folks. Um, we're not doing anything illegal. Um, there's a we're usually talking about these folks. Uh, a hackathon is is or a hack day. As some people say it's an event where uh, computer programmers, uh, graphic designers project managers collaborate to create solutions around a specific problem um, in the justice arena, in the legal profession. Uh, a lot of these hackathons have been um, uh, popping up to solve specific problems around the law, either it be uh, legal innovation in the uh, business context, but also the access to justice uh, uh, addressing the access to justice crisis and uh, addressing social justice issues. Um, this specific, so what goes on in a hackathon? Um, so in a hackathon, the, the goal of the hackathon is to address specific problems. And, and you do this by creating user designed solutions. Um, these solutions are usually you, you really want to make solutions in a hackathon useful. Um, you know, they, they have to solve specific problems uh, that, you know, in, in the legal aid or uh, legal services context, uh, they're solving a problem or addressing a problem, a specific problem. Uh, and in, in order, I think, uh, to really uh, get good solutions out of these models, you really want to have users involved. And I'll speak uh, on how we try to attempt in the design process. So uh, going back to the hackathon model, um, usually when you arrive, you kind of mingle, network. Um, once the event gets kicked off, uh, folks will pitch kind of like a Shark Tank style, very fast, uh, about two, three minutes of what their specific problem is. Um, and 
how they believe they can address it. Of course, um, usually what they think is a solution will likely iterate over time. Um, next, you, you build your group. So again, um, in the room, you'll have what you'll have is expert subject, subject matter experts. In this case, lawyers, uh, law students, folks that work in the legal profession with the Team Shot Hackathon, specifically folks that work in youth justice. Um, the next, uh, so after the teams form, uh, usually folks kind of ideate on that problem a little bit more using data and research that they gathered, uh, experts share their stories, um, and then you go into the building and developing. Uh, your goal in, ter in terms of building a solution is to get uh, a workable prototype out at the end of the hackathon. And I think that's the kind of key distinguisher between this hackathon model and what we uh, traditionally kind of do in legal services is uh, this model allows us to work and build quickly. And even if it's, it's a crappy solution, we get a solution out. And the process of the hackathon allows us to get feedback from the users, which are folks that will be uh, using uh, this solution or folks that are affected by the problem. So by working in a short, uh, continuous motion of really interacting with users allows you to build upon uh, some of these solutions. So the, again, the next step is to iterate, um, take the feedback that you get from uh, folks who are affected or uh, folks that uh, try it out, and then you improve. At, at the end of the hackathon, uh, the teams present uh, what they were able to accomplish in, in that 48 hours. Again, this kind of just goes over uh, uh, visually what goes on at a hackathon. Of course, you have your problem. Um, you know, again, the, define the parameters of the problem using data, user stories. Uh, and then you want to really ideate your solution. Um, during this stage, the ideation stage is key because what you'll have is a group of uh, uh, legal subject matter experts which really know about the problem and really work uh, with this problem uh, on an everyday basis. Um, and that session is really conveying to the other group of uh, 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 participants um, the user experience designers, the developers, uh, the data scientists of what this problem is so they can get a really good understanding. Um, and then the developers build code and sprint to build a workable pro prototype. Um, and again, uh, getting feedback uh, from users is key. Um, this is an example that I used. Um, there's an app uh, that is uh, wildly uh, successful called Do Not Pay, which uh, if you get a parking ticket, um, you'll, you can easily go on a mobile app and uh, you can, uh, through a series of questions that they ask, you can appeal your parking tickets. And the, uh, the app is free and it is, you know, it's already successfully appealed over 2.2 million parking tickets. Uh, so, and that, you know, thinking, of, thinking about it in the hackathon context, you know, you have this problem with parking tickets suck. I don't want to go to the court, take the time to go to the court uh, to appeal this thing. What, what can we do to solve this? And at a hackathon, you will build, through an ideation session, this almost kind of decision tree uh, motto of like, what are all these, you know, what are what they did for this specific application was they uh, basically took uh, the main forms of how uh, parking tickets were appealed, threw it on an algorithm, and built a workable prototype. Um, so in in the Team Child Hackathon, uh, again, we were addressing the problem of of youth justice, uh, uh, a lot of the problems that youth face. 
uh, uh, within the school to prison pipeline context um, from you know underserved teenagers who can't afford a, a lawyer to uh, the disproportionality of, of teens getting arrested and and detention and uh, we worked with Teen Child and Teen Child had a number number of solutions that they proposed um, in addition to a host of other community organizations that proposed ideas. Um, so it was a very collabor uh, collaborative event uh, which really brought out a lot of community members. Uh, I, I kind of want to just talk a little bit. Uh, last year we hosted the Social Justice Hackathon which revolved around um, how can we, uh, very generally, how can we use technology um, to increase access to justice in the same kind of hackathon model. Uh, with that hackathon, it was more general. So we had a lot of ideas from the landlord-tenant context to um, apps revolving around, uh, you know, getting information to survivors of domestic violence. Um, by narrowing the scope of the hackathon, I think it produces a lot of benefits uh, because you're able to get uh, higher quality solutions. You're able to have a, a greater depth uh, uh, of the problem with the, the number of uh, subject matter experts there. Um, you're able to bounce more ideas off of other teams uh, because you have folks that deal with a specific issue, uh, all dealing with kind of youth, youth justice issues. So it's, it's really beneficial and you can, you know, you can scale that hackathon um, back to you know just an organization, and and from the standpoint of a, a you know if organizations or legal aid organizations are interested in, in hosting a hackathon, I think it's uh, extremely beneficial, uh, not for just looking uh, looking innovatively at the law and uh, kind of really examining some of the problems that uh, folks face with their clients but also reaching out beyond the legal profession to help solve some of these problems. Um, so what to make of uh, hackathons? Uh, hackathons draw, um, a, again, a lot of critics. Uh, can, we make, can we actually make a sustainable solution uh, in a two-day period? Um, you know, uh, and uh, the answer is no, you can't. But the goal of the hackathon is to, one, be at the drawing table of how this innovation process works. Um, it's, it usually doesn't come over time, and this is, um, we usually want to build events that are built with the context that we need to support these teams after. So if organizations take this serious this is a great model to kind of innovate and help uh, solve some of the problems that uh, uh, organizations face. Uh, but in terms of designing this type of event, um, it's it's something that you go into uh, with you know in the long run uh, of really you know providing the avenue to get the teams. Uh, the solutions in the hands of the clients uh, because the folks who are uh, developers on the more technical side th they really benefit from you know having their stake in building um, social justice solutions so they come in it not knowing a lot of the problems that we have uh, you know in, our, in with this specific hackathon with youth justice a lot of folks from the uh, tech backgrounds didn't know, so they're able to benefit from learning um, a lot about some of these problems and have a, a stake in it, building something that uh, addresses these problems. And us in the legal profession get that technical expertise that I think it's it's really missing. And um, So moving beyond hackathons, uh, I think of course uh, the hack Teen Child Hackathon was a two-day, 48-hour event. Um, and again, in order to uh, address the sustainability portion, 
there needs to be uh, in the legal system a system in place where a lot of these projects that are coming out of hackathons get the adequate resources they need to sustain. Um, so here's an example of uh, Hill Innovative Justice. What they do is uh, where I see us moving next in the, in the profession um, is these accelerators. So taking some of, you know, some of the solutions that come out of the hackathon, um, um, really providing them the resources with capital, uh, getting them, um, you know, space to work uh, or an organization to uh, pilot their program. Um, the the, uh, the TIG program is another one. It's a formal rent process, but this kind of uh, really stands right beyond the hackathon model, and, you know, teams can apply. Uh, the Ryerson University Access to Justice Challenge is another uh, example. Um, they kind of took the hackathon model and said, uh, basically extended it for a longer period of time, six months, we're going to give you capital, we're going to give you space, we're going to give you resources. So it's really, you know, creating a healthy competition uh, to get more uh, folks at the driver's seat of innovation to solve some of these problems that really affect our, uh, uh, our justice system. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited and, and happy of what we were able to do at the Teen Child Hackathon um, because we were able to get, I, I believe we were able to get a lot of folks in the room um, from youth uh, to uh, folks from, you know, the prosecutor's office, public defense, and a host of other, in addition to Teen Child, a host of other um, uh, organizations that work in the space. Um, so we had a, a very healthy uh, collaboration uh, model going. So, so Miguel, yeah. with the with the Team Child Hackathon, uh, how many participants did you have there, and what was kind of the breakdown of, from the different industries? Yes, we had about uh, we had about fifty participants uh, at the Team Child Hackathon, and and folks pitched uh, folks pitched pitched ideas uh, relating to uh, solution problems around, uh, you're going to have one team that dealt with uh, reinstating suspended licenses, um, how do we increase the amount of uh, uh, problems around record selling for youth, um, if, if the youth had a, a juvenile record, uh, possibly creating uh, a, a solution that automates that process similar to Maryland's uh, expungement app. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, another thing that I really liked about this organization is that we had a lot of grassroots organizations come and pitch uh, ideas and solutions around very specific problems. So uh, kind of going back to the uh, context of what the makeup hackathons, I think a lot of folks um, um, they expect some. They expect a very kind of novel uh, solution to be built, and I think you can uh, rate a hackathon success by uh, their ability to solve a very specific problem. That uh, and that's what a lot of these organizations, uh, you know, raised. Uh, Youth Rise was. Uh, they pitched an idea to connect youth. Uh, you know, they they already had a mentorship program which helps uh, at-risk youth. They wanted to build a platform to connect and gamify. Uh, uh, you know, know your rights education um, and a host of other things. Um, so uh, today, so I'm, I'm happy. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so, so you participated in several different hackathons now. Um, what are some of the tips you would have for people who want to run a hackathon uh, for best practices? Like, what makes a good hackathon? I think uh, really, I think inclusive design is is key. Um, uh, and what that means is uh, having everyone at the table. I think one of uh, uh, what we did was I incorporated uh, 
a youth portion of the hackathon where youth actually came in and and you know we of course we gave them prizes and awards and uh, we had them participate in some fun you know activities but they were also uh, uh, you know they got to provide uh, feedback to the team so when you talk about building a, a user uh, design solution you have youth there giving their feedback um, also, in you know, making it an inclusive space uh, for everyone to work, respecting people. Um, I think thinking about the long term as you're organizing, uh, you know, uh, it's it's really hard to kind of maintain and keep up these solutions. But uh, really having uh, very strategic long term goals um, because there's there's so many different uh, ways. To get assistance beyond just the uh, hackathon, uh, uh, just the event, you know, out in Seattle, Washington, uh, companies like Microsoft they have a whole dedicated team to provide nonprofits technical assistance. So when you when you say uh, you know we 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 need more help to build this solution to get it to that stage, there's a host of technology organizations that help. Uh, nonprofits, in addition to uh, Code Fellows, who was our other uh, sponsor, um, you know, coding academies where you have boot camps of uh, junior developers who want to get their hands on, on working on something of substance. So uh, it's just a lot of resources. Having that uh, very long term strategy. Um, in addition to defining the scope, um, we we try to limit our scope as much as possible to just focus on uh, solutions around youth justice. Um, but you know, not to say that there's any problem with having a more broader scope, uh, but really focusing in on the scope because you get uh, you'll know who to kind of reach out to. So now I have the uh, honor uh, to present uh, Beyond 180. Okay, Caleb. All right. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks for listening. My name is Kaylin Yu, and I'll be representing the team and speaking on behalf of Beyond 180 today. And um, before we get started, I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a background to the 180 program as a whole, so that way you just have a little bit of context and understand what the program is all about. So the 180 is a juvenile diversion program that is partnered with the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, and together they work really hard to um, keep our at-risk youth out of the juvenile justice system and avoid criminal prosecution. So the 180 program consists of two elements. There is a half-day workshop, and then as a second element, there is the Beyond 180 Aftercare Follow-Up Program. Um, so basically, at the workshop, participating at-risk youth um, basically have the opportunity to have specified charges that have been filed against them to be dropped from their record upon successful uh, completion of the workshop. And this um, avoids the problem of further hindering employment educational opportunities in the future. At the end of each workshop, um, each youth is given a form to fill out that kind of segues the beginning of their journey into the Beyond 180 Aftercare Program, which I will show you here. And the Aftercare Program Basically, um, the youth have the option to fill out on their form additional services and resources they may need in order to um, make easier decisions to stay on the right path, and they can voluntarily be signed up and paired with a community ambassador. And the community ambassadors are really the heart and soul of Beyond 180, and they're the ones who work directly with each um, with each youth client and making sure that they have access to resources they need. So this can include additional services like educational services, counseling, health services, rehab, etc. And basically the main goal of these community ambassadors is to establish and form a solid, trustworthy, and meaningful relationship with each youth that they get assigned to. So that way, um, these youth feel like they have a dependable support system for however long 
that uh, for however long they need. And that was a pretty brief overview, but I would encourage anyone who's interested to check out the 180 program at 180program.org. Um, they have a great website and there's additional information that um, I think you guys might enjoy viewing. So initially, as, um, as a team participated in the Team Child Hackathon and we met with two community ambassadors from the Beyond 180 program, their main problem was that they did not have an efficient system for storing and managing youth client documentation. And this proved to be um, pretty problematic in the sense that with the wide breadth of clients that they were getting into the program and out of the program, um, having physical pieces of documentation and using Google Sheets was not a sustainable approach. So some of the problems they were facing was difficulty keeping track of each youth, um, limited access, restricted outreach, and the model was just not sustainable and providing an efficient means for the full potential of what the community ambassadors can do for each kid. So as we sat down and we collaborated with the community ambassadors, our team decided that it would be best to build out a Beyond 180 database and this is the piece that was covered over the weekend of the hackathon. We have now put on a user interface for it, which is something that we have been working on progressively as next steps after the hackathon. So on a technical side of things for the database, our team built out an API that wraps a relational database and basically allows interactions from a user perspective for um, youth clients and community ambassadors. So I'm going to do a little bit of a walkthrough now of a demo. So here, this is a live prototype that our designers have been building out over the past few weeks. Um, like I said, the database was something that we built out over the course of the weekend at the hackathon, and that's all back-end code. So um, there's not much of visual representation in that aspect. So to meet the uh, means of this presentation and to kind of give you guys a better idea of how it might look. Um, our designers put together this interactive prototype which will also better explain um, the features of our, of our database and how ambassadors and youth clients alike can interact with the database. So here, this first screen that you're looking at right now, this is something that a community ambassador would see after, um, after they sign in and it would just display all of the youth clients that um, are specific to them in their assignment. And as you can see on this page, we have, you know, contact, the ability to create a new list, um, find a service, create a report. And now let's kind of um, jump into what it might look like once we start searching for um, a specific youth client. So here, let's just say we're searching, let's just search the first one. There we go. And what happens is when you click on a certain client, um, you are navigated to their client profile and this has a bunch of information regarding the, that specific individual. So on this page you can see that there's um, a very organized format and fairly intuitive interface that um, is easy to navigate for the most part for ambassadors so that way um, they have a way to easily access all the information that they need. Um, for instance, you can see down here we also added a feature to um, create events that ambassadors can use and directly um, send them to each client so that way they're actively participating in their lives and each kid knows that knows what's going on, what events they can attend to, et cetera. And farther to the right, we see just different methods of contact. So there's an email option, phone call, text. Um, and if you guys are curious what event might look like, we can go ahead and open that up. And if you click on this, um, you just follow out as a community ambassador, you fill out um, the according information and then you have the ability to directly send that to um, the client based on what method of communication works best for them, which is something that they specify when they register. So let's go back. Um, I also want to let you guys see um, this little eye right here. Um, once you click this, much more information specific to this individual shows up. So let's go ahead and click this. 
And you can see um, in regards to support information, contact information about the clients, parent information, risk factors, and forms. Um, I'll go through some of them. So if we click support information, it displays the name of the community ambassador and the plan that they have established um, between each other as a method to kind of best approach whatever goal they've set out to achieve together. There's also contact information. So this includes, you know, phone number, email, um, address as well. And we can go through one more. Let's go through about. And then you just have basic, basic information about the client. And um, mind you, this is a prototype that's in progress. So we, we will be taking account of more finite details. But we just wanted to have something to kind of give you guys an idea of what this will look like um, once we finally implement our future features. And then that option there is just to show you how you can navigate to update information accordingly. And then if you guys want to see how it might look to text them, we would just hit the text option. And it directly opens up a text message with that individual. You can type something in here. We'll just do like, um, hey, Harry. We'll go ahead and send that. And then it shoots the text over to them. So as you can. As you guys can hopefully see, um, the direction that we're working toward, like I said, um, it's in progress. And for the means of today, we just had to put together what we could and then keep in mind all of the future, all of the future um, features that we want to implement. So um, now we'll transition back over to the PowerPoint. And we'll just get into. Um, We'll just get into since the hackathon to kind of tell you guys about what we've been doing um, since that weekend. <clears throat> so since the hackathon, uh, the developers, designers, and community ambassadors have been collaborating along with Miguel, um, working toward a finished product. Um, this includes detailed outlines of how we're going to approach and interface a front end onto the back end to make that prototype that you guys saw come to life. And um, this is something that we're working on iteratively. And we're staying in touch with each other and communicating frequently to um, ultimately reach that, reach that outcome. Um, some things that we'll have to change in regard to resources that we have considered is that for the back end in the database, we were using MySQL and deploying on Heroku. Um, you know, for the means of the hackathon, it was great, but MySQL and Heroku will not be scalable or sustainable for a more robust database, which we plan on um, we plan on building because we want this to be something a reliable database that they can use and it can grow and it can scale. So for the future, we are going to be using Aurora for our database and AWS, which if you don't know the acronym, it's just Amazon Web Services. For deployment and this will kind of allow us to take that step in the direction that we want um, this application to go meaning you know being scalable reusable and um, just a more solid uh, product and um, that's really it for now so I just want to thank you guys for listening and again um, feel free to check out their website to get additional information about Beyond 180 and the 180 program. And um, I guess just shoot us any questions. I have a quick question, yeah. uh, Kayla. Uh, so uh, why did you uh, participate in the Team Child Hackathon? And, and as a, from a technical standpoint, what did you benefit or what did you get out of uh, participating in this hackathon? That's a great question. Um, so I actually was a student at Codefellows at the time that I heard about the Team Ch Team Child Hackathon, and that's how um, I got involved. And what piqued my interest was that the goal behind Team Child and what the hackathon was getting at was something that I felt was really meaningful and would be a great opportunity for me to finally see how my technical skills can directly make a positive impact on my community. And I think that participating in this hackathon really drove that point, um, really drove that point home to me. And um, it's just made me realize how much space there is for technology to um, improve uh, certain parts of the community. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. 
Um, at, at this time, we're going to pass it to uh, the next team, uh, which is going to be uh, Kristen uh, Fairflick, who's going to be presenting uh, the project that they created, which uh, revolves around uh, reinstating your uh, suspended license. Um, so if we can get that screen. Cool. Okay. Um, well, hey there. I'm Kristen, and thank you for the opportunity to present today. Uh, as Kaylin said, it was a really fun and, for me especially, I think insightful um, day of learning and, and collaboration. So we'll share a bit about um, our project and the problem that we tackled. And if there are questions, we're happy to answer them. Um, we do have our two other team members, Sarah and Catherine, that are on the line, I believe, as well. We were one of the smaller teams, just three of us here. I think perhaps, yeah, the, the team of three, I think, was, was the smallest there. So small but mighty. We had two staff attorneys with Team Child, which for me was huge because as a designer, um, I've worked in a number of products and industries, but not necessarily in this specific one. So I was learning kind of on steroids that day and having that subject matter expert help uh, was huge. It would have been impossible to do without them. So with that, I'll share a little bit about um, the issue that we're tackling. Reinstating suspended licenses for us is huge, and it opens a world of possibility for thousands of people. As of 2011, there were over 300,000 Washington licenses that had been suspended for failure to pay tickets, whether that's a speeding ticket or a parking ticket. But there's a lot of other reasons that can result in a suspended, suspended license, and that was a few years back. So our estimate is that as of this date, we have about a half a million people in Washington State alone that have struggled with this issue, and many of them, as a result of having their license suspended, um, sometimes without even their knowledge, uh, they face criminal charges. So our goal is to help that problem, um, or to avoid that problem entirely, and help folks uh, avoid those charges. Part of the trickiness of this problem that we're tackling is that many individuals don't even realize their license has been suspended. Let's say you get a parking ticket in Seattle and for whatever reason you don't get the payment in. Perhaps you didn't get noticed or your life is just busy as, as they tend to be um, and that payment doesn't happen. Uh, after a certain amount of time, that can actually roll into a criminal charge and when you get, say, pulled over for speeding or any number of... Um, of issues if your license is, is swiped, so to speak, uh, you can then realize at that point in time that you're facing criminal charges. So uh, this oftentimes is a surprise for many youth and others and it can affect their ability to seal their record. But when they have that criminal charge, they're not able to seal their record for another two years. And that was really um, what I think for Sarah, Catherine and I um, really made this problem so worthy of you know our attention and, and, and thought and effort in this. Uh, sealing a record for a youth opens up a lot of opportunities. It means that when they're applying for a job um, or for a loan, say, that previous record isn't going to come back and haunt them. The employers don't look at that and um, it doesn't, it's not an impediment to their, to their application. So for us, we really wanted to make sure that youth could seal their record, which is prevented when they have the criminal record. So as an example here, we want to make sure that we're, um, as designers, that we're understanding the users and where they're coming from. So we spoke with a few people and did a lot of research on this and, um, and wanted to present this example. Let's say we have um, a young woman who receives a parking ticket and she does want to pay it. She wants to resolve this, but she has two young children and uh, she holds two jobs. And so it just doesn't really happen. It gets kind of lost in the busyness of day-to-day um, of -day life. She also moves about a year later, and so those reminders don't actually reach her. And two years later, when she's pulled over for speeding, uh, the, the cop tells her that your license is actually suspended, and this is a criminal charge. So she's faced now with this question of, how do I deal with this? I, I don't know where to turn. And luckily, there are a lot of resources. We have the Department of Licensing, uh, websites like the DMV, uh, and as uh, Miguel mentioned earlier, apps like Don't Pay Anything. There's also a number of wonderful nonprofits and advocacy groups like the Center for Justice, Northwest Justice, Northwest Justice Project, uh, and centers like Team Child that's on the line with us here. They have a lot of great resources, but as we were going through them during the hackathon and kind of taking an inventory of what was out there, um, it does seem like there is an information overload. They're, the resources aren't necessarily formatted or structured in ways that are easy for, um, for individuals short on time um, and perhaps not as familiar with the, with the topic to, to grasp. I spent 30 minutes myself going through it uh, and still had tons of questions for Sarah and Catherine. They're not all user-friendly. Uh, as an example, one of the PDFs told me, 
now go through these 20 courts, call all of them and figure out which ticket, uh, you know, where, where the issue lies. And for a lot of folks, um, that simply isn't feasible. You know, there are certain hours they can call and they have work and it's just not going to happen. A lot of them are also region specific. And drivers don't also necessarily know that there are groups available to help them through this. So there isn't really um, a great way for users to tackle that at this point. There's things out there, but there's opportunities for improvement. So Sarah, Catherine, and I wanted to devise something that was mobile friendly, meaning it could be accessed on any device and it wasn't a PDF that required download. Um, and it could leverage existing resources. Our goal was not to reinvent the wheel here and to, um, to kind of negate everything already out there. We wanted to bring those tools together into a system that could um, kind of make the sum of its parts, or I guess the, the sum greater than, than its parts. We compile the data for the drivers rather than requiring them to gather information for themselves. So as an example I mentioned earlier, in one case the driver was asked to call 20 different courts and find out what the process was and, and in which court they had to uh, pursue the issue. Our goal would be to compile the data for them so that they have all that information at their fingertips. Importantly, we also use progressive disclosure, which is a term meaning that we show people only what they need when they need it. So instead of a 20-page PDF or a long scrolling web page, we give them information in bite-sized pieces saying, first do this and then click the checkbox. Now do this. And we kind of follow them along their, their journey to resolving the issue, which makes it a lot more user-friendly and a lot less, um, kind of facing a lot less information overload. We also make the process interactive and encouraging, giving them kind of digital high fives along the way. And we provide access to advocacy groups so that if they do have questions, they know that there are folks out there that can help them through this issue. So uh, in the TurboTax of license free statement, someone was looking at the prototype and said, this is really like TurboTax. It walks you through the process step by step, um, and we've kind of adopted that name there. What we'll be showing you today is the low fidelity prototype, so what we call grayscale or wireframes, um, which is what we presented during the hackathon. And there's work to be done here still, but we are a team of three and are looking for additional assistance in building it up further. Uh, so you'll see kind of the process that we arrived at during that day-long hackathon. Um, and kind of we can discuss the next steps that, that would take to build this out full scale as we go. So we'll take a look here. Uh, let's say you're an individual that is realized, unfortunately, either at the DOL or because you're pulled over, that your license is suspended. So you're using your mobile phone. You could also access it via a library computer. Uh, to learn more about what you do next. In this prototype, we bring people first to the Department of Licensing website where they have information that's only available there. Specifically, we're looking for the court that they need to contact to resolve the issue and the reason for this issue. So was it a parking ticket or were they speeding? So we ask folks to click the button here and report back the reason uh, and the court. From there, they'll hit go and be brought to kind of the next stage. Now, this is just one screen to another, but what actually happened in the back end um, is a lot of kind of data filtering. We have, as I mentioned, a number of courts with different processes in each one. So if you were pulled over uh, in Arlington, for example, the process in the Arlington court is very different than it might be in, say, Seattle. And so the impetus previously was on drivers to call those courts and figure out, did they need to write a letter, to send an email, to make a phone call, to apply in person to remove the criminal charge. Uh, there's a lot of different steps for different courts, and the courts aren't always super transparent about that. There's not typically a website um, showing you how it all works, and the clerks can be difficult to, to access. So what we do on the back end is compile all this information for them, and when they tell us in the previous screen that this was actually in Seattle and it was because of a parking ticket, we can then tell them immediately, okay, based on the data we have, you need to request a hearing. We provide them with, uh, you can see here, the, the text is actually in gray boxes, which is typical in design of kind of um, text to come. We give them a phone number as well as some talking points for that request. For example, uh, we might discuss tone. You want to avoid things like, it wasn't my fault or I had no choice. Instead, we'd uh, coach them on a few things they might want to bring up and the tone they should be using during that phone call. They then click, okay, I'm ready to call the court and move on to uh, the next slide. How did it go, being personable and approachable? At this point, we'd have some logic branching. They would either say, I got the hearing, or I have heard I need to write to formally request one, or perhaps I can't get a hearing. So at this point, the, the user has different options. We're going to go with option two, saying I need to write to request a hearing. So they click that middle button. 
and jump over to let's write that letter. We provide them with some pointers as we did before and we're actually going to, in the next slide, guide them through the process. We provide a template that gives them everything they need uh, with some spaces for them to plug in their specific information. So as an example, they might plug in their ticket number, just type that in, uh, the date on which they got the ticket, and sign their name. And this would again be a customized based on the sort of incident that they, were, uh, that they found in the DOL website. From there, they can save the letter for printing or perhaps even automatically emailing the courts. We don't leave them there though, we give them some follow-up information and ask them to return once they hear back so that they can continue through the process um, with this device. Let's say I got a hearing and then they're reminded on the objects or the items they need to bring with them to court. So perhaps they need to have various documentation which we remind them of here and they can actually click a check to say yes I have it or no I don't so that on that day they'll be reminded of everything they need to bring with them. So the implications for a tool like this um, are really huge. As I mentioned before, our estimate is that about a half a million people in Washington State alone have struggled with this. And of course, if they have a criminal record, it again is difficult to seal that record for actually two years. So if they're able to roll the criminal charge back to a misdemeanor in court, they are able to seal their record and they can do things like get a house, get a job, uh, take their children on field trips. They don't have to worry about that charge coming back to haunt them. This is, all, of course, all on top of the personal feeling and the kind of the sentiment one has when they're no longer dealing with that stress and those issues. This is, I think, a great quote from someone that was served by the Center for Justice saying, I feel like having my license back makes me feel like a contributor to society in a positive way, the way I used to be. And that really kind of hit home for me. So it's, it's an emotional toll this process takes and we want to make it as easy as possible for users, both youth and older individuals. So with that, um, we wanted to thank you guys for the opportunity to present, and if there's questions, we're of course happy to answer them. We do have the 15 child representatives on the line, which is awesome. They were huge in this process. Um, and so thank you. I'll turn it back over to you, Miguel. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, uh, excellent job. Uh, I guess my first question is, what were some of the limitations uh, that you all faced uh, while building this? You say you only had a team of three. Sure, and Miguel, I'm just turning it back over to you if that's okay, unless you'd like me to keep it here. Okay, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, limitations. Um, I think, man, it is only a day. So as you can see here, we had a grayscale prototype. Um, but that was, I think, for us, it was enough to get kind of the creative juices flowing and importantly to start testing it, to testing the idea with the, uh, the attorneys that deal with this. Another step in this process would be to get out with you so that youth that have had their license suspended um, and then actually test and see how well this works. Uh, there's always um, various degrees and, and kind of in-depth levels of testing, um, but we've kind of scratched the surface there. So um, time and then access to our specific demographic is a bit of a challenge, but challenges um, are oftentimes what make you more creative, so, <laughs> so it's a good thing. All right. And uh, just one more question. How was it while working uh, at the hackathon, were you able to get, you know, get information or advice from other teams? Were you able to collaborate or was there any anything, any kind of synergies going on with uh, you helping, uh, well, helping you get quicker to your uh, prototype from the other folks in the room? Yeah, man. Um, well, it was nice that we had um, a range of attorneys that focused in different areas and so they could all come and kind of share their expertise uh, from the clients that they had served. Uh, you mentioned there's there's a wealth of, um, of designers and programmers um, and folks just kind of interested in the space. And so it was interesting to collaborate with them and kind of bounce some ideas off of each other. I was sitting down with another designer that has, um, he's a senior designer with years in the industry, and we kind of talked through some of the challenges um, with you know designing a prototype like this and, and discussed would this be better as an app or as a website um, and, and various questions like that. You and I actually, Miguel, had a discussion too about um, about a ticket you faced in the past and so it's always good to hear from users um, drawing from our own experience as well as importantly that from others um, that's a huge portion of it. So I think it was a great group to be working with and having the diversity that you brought to the hackathon was really key. Cool. And you uh, mentioned kind of almost piggy into my last question in terms of, uh, yeah, that UI, uh, UX design aspect in terms of, you know, getting empathy, building this user-centered solution. How important is that? 
It's huge. It's huge. Um, and I think there are people understand when you have a day-long hackathon, even a two-day hackathon, um, that your time is is limited, and you may not be able to get in front of as many people as you want to get in front of, and kind of test it with as many users as as you would like. Um, but you make the best with what you can, and like I said, having those restrictions forces you to move fast. And so long as you kind of lay your assumptions out, you know what assumptions you're making, you can always go back and test those later. Um, so you have to move fast in hackathons, but that I think is kind of some of the, like what makes it unique and a fun place to be. Um, but definitely learning as much as you can about the issue. Like I, I learned so much about this particular problem that day, and I hadn't, and you know, faced like I hadn't had that experience before working in this um, in this area. And so my goal was to come and learn, and I absolutely achieved that. Uh, and my hope is that um, as more of these sort of hackathons come up, people will continue to kind of step outside their own boundaries and find things they wouldn't typically encounter. It really does make you, I think more aware of, um, of the issues in your community and, this, and helps you find the things that you really want to dive into because you're really passionate about them. Cool, thank you. Uh, well, I want to thank you know both of our presenters. I, at, at this time, I kind of want to open uh, the floor up for uh, questions if any participants or attendees uh, had any questions. Um, so one thing is, as you're doing outreach, um, to lawyers to try to get them involved. Um, what is kind of the pitch that you give there? Because this is definitely a novel concept for lawyers. Yeah, no, that that uh, it, it's definitely a challenge to to get. Uh, uh, I think it it starts with the problem. Like, okay, what you know, you know, kind of laying it on the on the floor. What uh, what are the problems that you face? In terms of one, either reaching more clients, what are some of the limitations that you face, uh, or some of the issues uh, with clients that, uh, or you know, specific issues with uh, some of the things that you work on, and creating a space where uh, lawyers or, or folks uh, that are in the legal profession aren't intimidated by uh, the, the the technology piece, because it, it seems like you know a few, uh, from the legal standpoint, if I was introduced to this kind of model, I'm like, well, you know, I'm not a designer, I don't know anything about technology, uh, and really kind of dis dispelling that uh, knowledge that you have to have a, a certain level of competency. I think lawyers and people in the legal profession, they bring their legal expertise, and that is all that you have to have uh, around a specific problem. And kind of really laying out the benefits of how uh, uh, of how what you can make, what are the goals, um, and also you know really you know talking in terms of feasibility, uh, how what what will it take to get this product in the hands of the clients? Um, so yeah, those are those are some of the things I guess to to get more attorneys and even law students out at these events. Excellent. I, I think the partnership with um, the law schools that you've had, both with the Social Justice Hackathon and with the Teen Child event, definitely brought some students in. I remember uh, one of the teams there, the um, uh, the one that Justice Mary you worked with on uh, mapping uh, resources for homeless youth. That was almost entirely like undergrad uh, CSE students from one of the uh, from Seattle U there. So, getting students involved is definitely a, a huge positive to these events. Yeah, and in, in addition to to students, uh, really thinking about uh, uh, collaborating with partners outside, not only outside the the legal profession, but just kind of new partners. Uh, uh, you know, Team Child was able to collaborate with a lot of folks in uh, the tech industry. Uh, you know, uh, this whole technology community. Um, in terms of you know, building those types of relationships uh, uh, with folks, you know, if, if they need help on, uh, you know, say like updating their website or something, mm -hmm. like keeping a good repository of these contacts, it's it's great to. Uh, Kind of help or making a document more user friendly. Um, in addition to 
as you know for these types of events you have to get sponsors so that's another avenue of building sustainable relationships with uh, uh, additional partners uh, a lot of technology companies uh, they're thrilled to sponsor these types of events mm -hmm. and uh, if they you know if you you know have a good structure or, or uh, uh, form to the hackathon, then they'll likely be willing to support uh, this event. Um, so we've got a question here, which is actually a really common question that comes up, which is, uh, it's for the Beyond 180 folks, um, that the app is very cool, but do clients have smartphones? I'll give a very short one, and then I'll answer, and then I'll turn it over. Um, Internet, uh, Pew Research Center for Internet and Society definitely has stats on this, but we're seeing 20 to 30 percent of client health things in that poverty area. Uh, a Smartphone is their only access to the internet and they may have limited data, so mobile optimizing and developing for phones um, is actually really important to our uh, client populations that are below the 200% uh, percent of the poverty line and the younger individuals are, the statistics are, the higher the chances are that they're going to have access there. But uh, what? What was your experience there and why, why did you guys go with an app instead of uh, web page or um, some other type of resource? Great. Uh, that's a really great point and um, this is actually something that we put into consideration and uh, I'll take some of the blame for not making that very clear during the presentation. Um, it is going to be a desktop application and can scale to mobile. That prototype specifically was specific to what someone might see on their phone. So. For the future, we have been considering how we want to tackle mobile optimization to take into account for people, um, youth with limited data, and we also are taking into account for, you know, what if they don't have a phone, or can they access, sit down at a computer at a local library or somewhere and pull up the same application on a desktop. So these are things that we'll be working with in the future to ensure that it is able to reach out to everyone in the demographic and consider um, special use cases like the ones that um, you just presented. And I just want to follow up and say uh, a majority of uh, uh, legal services websites and uh, different tools are not mobile responsive. That means uh, that when you look at that information on your mobile device, it kind of, uh, it, it will look like what it looks like on a, a regular uh, computer page. So it makes it really hard uh, and inaccessible for the user to uh, dive through and gather, uh, like say, specific information about a, a legal problem if, that, uh, if those websites and that information isn't transferred uh, to what you call a mobile responsive, so where it looks clear concise um, uh, on a mobile device. Can I, can I add something there? Definitely, Claudia. Yeah. Yes. Hi, everyone. This has been an excellent um, presentation, and I hope that our attendees get excited about technology and bringing expertise from outside of the re legal realm uh, to solve access to justice pro problems. I think that on the question of, you know, do you design um, hybrid, mobile, and and desktop platforms, or do you design primarily for mobile? I think that the key is some of the things that Miguel said at the beginning is that you have to have an inclusive design team, um, mm -hmm. so because because you really need to know, and then if you can do surveys of who your potential users would be, um, so that you can understand, you know whether they're going to expect to print from the mobile or anything mm -hmm. like that because for example if it's um, like what we saw today it's great because it's communication right communication between yeah. two people or whatever um, mm -hmm. and so you know you gotta know do your users have the mobile phone what percentage of them are gonna be mobile only versus people there's I think about 80 percent of people that use mobile also use desktop so mm -hmm very interesting for legal aid to be at this point where we're kind of at the at the crux of a revolution hopefully soon in a tipping point where we will have websites and tools that can go back and forth really well 
um, particularly if you're doing more that's just information and referral. Um, but I think it's key to have from the beginning an inclusive group and to do what but what Brian said is about the relationships because um, mm -hmm. as it is, you know, there is a lot of energy but what I think it's that sometimes people are like the legal aid folks are staying in the legal aid silo, the courts are mm -hmm. staying in the court tech silo and talking to the vendors that sell to courts, then you have, um, you know, that kind of thing. And one thing that I think it's important is to also look at how people are connecting to the internet. Um, we have found in my platform, Law Help Interactive, which is an online platform, that we have a, not a, I wouldn't say a huge group, but a growing number of people that are reaching us through their Xbox and through their okay. tool machines, you know, and so that if they're already using that to, to reach out to the internet, what opportunities does that create in, ter in terms of putting tools maybe on those machines, you know, like, or right. the, the whole idea of gamification, could, could some of these things, the ones that are educational and not transactional, could they be gamified um, for the greater good? So I think there's, mm -hmm. it's a really exciting time, but I think that, you know, reach out and talk to the people that have been doing the work because a lot of us just want to spur innovation and get you connected um, regardless of what system you end up using. The important thing is to keep moving forward. Right. So you, you just made a, a good point there which segues into um, another question that we had over uh, what type of events are people aware of. Um, I've got up here on the screen right now the Social Justice Game Jam um, which Northwest Justice Project is hosting um, at the uh, Living Computer Museum here in the Seattle area. It's going to be the weekend after Valentine's Day in February, February 17th, 18th, 19th. Um, it is on a, a donation model. Anybody can participate and, and pay what they want. Um, we'll be covering at least coffee and hopefully food there. Um, our sponsors include University of Washington's um, Law School, Unity, and Oculus Rift. Um, but this is an opportunity for people to get involved. Uh, before the upcoming TIG conference, um, there is a uh, one-day hackathon. It's a Drupal-specific hackathon. Projects include okay. uh, developing a knowledge management system through Drupal, um, some type of data structure um, project, and there's still an opportunity for people to register that if you're going to be in San Antonio for that conference. Um, Miguel, are you aware of any other uh, events coming up that people might want to look at? Yes. Um, I don't have the specific link here, but I can uh, potentially provide it to you uh, following this, but uh, Tech for Justice uh, initiatives out of uh, uh, New Mexico, they will be hosting a, a veterans a hackathon in, at the ABA Tech Show, I believe, in March. Um, and that's going to uh, be revolved around vet, uh, legal issues that veterans face and uh, empowering veterans to get legal services. So I can forward you more information on that as well. That would be great. We'd be happy to add that to our blog and also get it out on the LS Tech uh, email list because um, I know some people are planning on going to at least the events um, after, which I think is the EJC conference, so if people can make it early to the tech show, um, that would be great. Um, any other questions or final words or thoughts? Well, I just want people to reach out, you know, reach out to LSNTAP or reach out to Pro Bono Net. Um, reach out to the A2J fellows. Um, if you're interested in technology and don't know much about legal aid, we can connect you. If you know a lot about legal aid, but you don't know what's going on, what's happening, what's who's doing really good work, um, what are the what are the things that are the challenges, how are they being tackled, mm -hmm. reach out because um, what we want to do is continue to be relevant in the lives of the people that are out there that need help. And we also need our lawyers to have state-of-the-art technology and tools 
so that they can do the really great um, litigation and advocacy on behalf of the communities we serve. So uh, it doesn't matter if you're looking out for the public use or for the lawyer use or the pro bono use, reach out. That's, you know, that's, we're very lucky that now we have a mature enough community um, where we understand things a little better than we did you know, in 1999, when the internet was coming up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to take the time to thank again uh, Ella Sintop. Uh, take the time to thank uh, Pro Bono Net and Claudia uh, Johnson specifically. She was a judge at the hackathon, um, and she got you know to see firsthand of all the different. Uh, uh, presentations. Uh, so really taking a, a being involved at the driver's seat of, of, of promoting this innovation in the ball. Um, i definitely like to take the time to thank uh, 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 Code Fellows who provided a great location and of course uh, Team Chow who uh, really uh, took a, a risk uh, and uh, to take a step in the direction of of exploring ways to innovate uh, the law and legal services and uh, specifically uh, youth justice issues. So I think in, in order to kind of foster new bold ideas, we're going to thank you, uh, Team Child, as well. Um, yeah. Yes, definitely. They, also, thank you, Miguel, for uh, putting this together and all of the speakers today. Greatly appreciated. Uh, we put links in the chat to the Social Justice Game Jam, um, to the uh, YouTube channel that you see here where all of our past trainings are, um, also to the uh, Legal Aid Drupal um, Hackathon that's coming up. Um, and we will be posting about these events on the blog over at LSMTAP. Um, thank you all for coming in here, especially on this uh, cold day here in Seattle. Uh, greatly appreciate it, and I look forward to seeing you guys at some future events.